You know, anyone ought to realize that God is a God of order, not of confusion. And since he is a God of order, he must have an orderly manner by which he's going to bring about his world. Now, since God is not the author of confusion, but of order and peace, he's got to have a system by which he brings about the world of all. There is a way by which nations are dealt with and brought into his world. It's not going to be some kind of a scrambled uh, approach. God is a very orderly God, and, and he has worked out a system by which nations are going to be brought under his control in a very systematic and orderly manner. Here in Acts, I've read this many a time, but in Acts, the 17th chapter, we begin to get a little insight to this. Acts 17, commencing in verse 24, it says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needs anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. He's the one that uh, made sure the Chinese people were the type people they are and they, they would be in that particular era of the earth. It didn't just happen. If, if God had left this to chance, the Manassites would not have been here with the most advantageous area of the earth by way of which God could get a work done in the end time and also let his people Manasseh experience wealth and power unlike any other nation to learn how not to use it. So they'd be willing when they repent to use their experiences and to capitalize on their talents and abilities in the right way in the world of mind and then make the contrast between the way it is under God's rule as opposed to the way it was under Satan's rule. God made sure the British people were where they are today. That the British Commonwealth could not have been the Commonwealth had they not been where they were. What if the German people had ended up where Britain is and the British people had ended up where the Germans are? It'd be a different world because the Germans would have ruled the world. Because the British had every opportunity, had they been of a mind the German people are, to have ruled the world. Now what if God had, uh, had allowed the communist world, the Russians, to be where the uh, Germans are and the Germans be where the Russians are to be a different pro prophetic picture. He's enclosed the Russians where they have to come out in the end. In other words, the Chinese and the Russians are in such a position they can only dominate at the very end of the development of nations. So God had to make sure all the nations were in a particular place. They, he didn't just put them here and say, well, where are they going? And, and Christ said, I don't know. Do you know? And he said, I don't know. Let's watch them. And they just kind of, you know, ended up. How could God make promises through Jacob to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of the Israelites that they'd be in particular places unless he manipulated. So God's very much in charge. We'll go on and read it here. Verse 26, And has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. Get that? God has already... Before he even began, as he began to create nations through Adam and Eve, and the nations began to develop and emerge, and especially the side of the flood as they were carried over through Noah and his sons, God determined which nations would be, where they would be, and how long they'd be there. In other words, he has to make sure there's been certain interplay between nations so that he can capitalize on their experiences in the world tomorrow and in the general resurrection, so they can reflect back on how they didn't get along, then they can see how they do get along. So he's not going to uh, waste the experiences of 6,000 years. Why put humanity through 6,000 years of experience and then forget about it? Why not start uh, where he would be going tomorrow if the experience had no bearing on the future? So the way by which nations experience life with whom and at what time has a direct bearing on capitalizing on their experience in the world to come. So he says God has determined where they would be, how long they'd be there, and what their boundaries would be. For what purpose? That they should seek the Lord. Eventually nations are going to seek God. So he's got a system by which he deals with nations until they finally come to where they will seek him. Now only a few 
as Paul brought out here, few Gentiles had at that time, but the nations finally will turn to God and seek him. God has a master plan by which he will bring nations to repentance in a very systematic manner and absorb them in his world as he builds it. I think all of you should have, as I do, the confidence that Christ, the living head of this church, will lead Mr. Armstrong and Garner Ted in this work to see before things happen to bring about this orderly world just exactly how it's going to happen so God can reach the nations, tell them about the world to come, and also warn them of that which is going to finally have to do with bringing them to their senses. Amos 3, verse 7, makes this very specific. For God here says, Surely the Lord God, the eternal God, will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Not the secret of the world. The nations know nothing about a God dealing with humanity, and for what purpose. But before God intervenes to begin to bring nations to repentance, starting with his people Joseph, he's got to let them know, or they wouldn't know God's dealing with them. How could Israelites and then Gentiles ever repent unless they come to have a knowledge of God and understand that his spanking is to bring about a certain result? So they turn to him and say, now we're willing to follow you. If America, Canada, and Britain went into the tribulation without hearing why, they wouldn't learn any more than any other nation that's gone into captivity in the past. They wouldn't know why. They wouldn't know anything about turning to God. They wouldn't know anything about a world tomorrow and the tribulation wouldn't do them any good. So God promises here he'll do nothing unless he reveals it to his servants the prophets. Now, how specific is the message to God's people, Ephraim and Manasseh in particular, going to have to be in the very near future? Hosea makes it quite plain, and Hosea is a, a book that shows how God is going, that God is going to bring Israel to repentance. And he's going to reject his people Israel, and he's going to bring them repentance, and he's going to claim and say, you are my people now. So it's an overall brief summary of the fact God is going to bring salvation to Israel, and Hosea does mean salvation. So uh, here in Hosea 5 and verse 9, God begins to get rather specific, and he says, Ephraim, which is Great Britain, shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. So he doesn't leave anything to guesswork. He says that area over there is going to be desolate. So the people aren't going to remain there. They're going to be scraped into captivity. And anyone ought to know that the German's uh, philosophy is to take their enemies away from their homeland, divide them, and prevent them from uniting and rising up to fight back. That's what they did with their prisoners in World War II. They would transplant them and break down ties with a homeland and divide them so they couldn't, you know, um, mass themselves together and rise up to be a potential danger. That's their strategy. Now, so he says, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke among the tribes of Israel. Have I made known that which shall surely be? Now, there's the promise. And God cannot break his word. The scripture cannot be broken. So he says, before Ephraim goes into captivity, God will have made known among the tribes of Israel what shall surely be. Hosea 7, verse 12, mentions this in just a little different way. He says, When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation has heard. Get that? <clears throat> God says, I'm going to punish Israel just the way they've been told. Then they're going to know. He says, I will chastise them as their congregation has heard. That's how specific it's going to finally get. When Mr. Armstrong is before the Congress of the United States, Parliament of Canada and Britain, he's not going to speak in vague terms and say, well, I just don't know. I kind of get a feeling every now and then that God is a little unhappy with you people, but I still have hope you're all going to repent and build churches all over the countryside, and we're all going to get better and better. Now, I've got my sidekick, Norman Vincent Peel, who has the bootstraps that he'll pass out by which everyone flips himself over three times and makes himself into God. 
No, he won't approach in that way. He'll just let them know you're about to go into national captivity because you have failed to heed the warning. Now, I'll tell you about a world to come, and that will be your only hope when this calamity hits you. And God is going to bring you to your senses so he can wake you up and bless you in the world tomorrow. But you've got to turn to him. And here's what's going to happen. Then when it happens, they're going to know God spoke to them through a servant. So it has to be very specific before they learn the lesson and know God is dealing with them. So they can turn to a God they know is there. If they don't know is there, they wouldn't begin to think about turning to him. Now going back to Hosea 5, God gets pretty specific here about the time element. In uh, Hosea 5, verses 13 through 15, he says, When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, which is going to come very soon. Probably the Arabs are going to really inflict uh, uh, quite a blow on them somewhere in the near future. And Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrians. Instead of learning the lesson of World War I and II, they're going to think that somehow their salvation lies in Europe. When the Germans have risen up to try to destroy them on two occasions in the past. See, we just don't learn from history. So they're going to think our security lies in Europe now. And they're trying to, uh, of course, introduce uh, uh, the uh, systems, you know, that conform to Europe. So they become more and more like Europe. Their currency, their uh, uh, system of measurement and so forth, they're doing it so they can be compatible with the, the continent. So he says, and they went to Assyria and, and sent to King Jerob. Yet could he not heal you nor cure you of your wound? For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away, and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me early. Now what's their affliction? They're coming tribulation. So they're going to finally seek God in their affliction because they've got to hear about him before they get there. Because they're not going to hear about God from the Pope and the Germans. So they've got to hear in advance so when they go into captivity they know why and they turn to God. How long is it going to be? Verses 1 through 3 of chapter 6 begins to outline it. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn. In other words, that's the tribulation, and he will heal. Now, how would they know anything about tearing and then healing unless we tell them that God is going to tear you through the tribulation, but he'll heal you. He will send Christ back and deliver you out of captivity and heal you and make you his people in the world to come. They will know that when the captivity occurs. They say, yes, he's torn, but he's also going to heal. Who's going to tell them that? They don't know anything about it today. If they went into captivity before the message really is given to them in specific terms, and the masses here, they wouldn't know any more in captive than they knew before. But they're going to know that God tore them. But he will also heal them. They're going to believe in the world tomorrow. And he will heal us, and he has smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. Of course, in prophecy, a day represents a year. So in other words, after two years, he will revive us. In the third year, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. By then they will. In other words, the tribulation will last two years. Then there are going to be the heavenly signs, which introduce the day of the Lord, which begins to break up the United States of Europe, which begins to raise up the Israelites, lest they all be destroyed. So God begins to lift the pressure up after two years of tribulation by intervening through the heavenly signs and then beginning to plague the Babylonian system. So he gets their minds off of systematically destroying all Americans and Canadians and British. So he begins to raise them up in the third year, but not completely. They won't really have the freedom to live until they're living in his sight. And we shall live in his sight. They're going to know that Christ is going to come back, sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. They're going to be delivered in the land of Palestine, and he's going to be there leading them, and they're going to see him. And then that's when they're really going to begin to live. So God not only says, I'm going to warn them and let them know specifically how it's all going to work out, but he even gives us a timetable. 
as to how long they're going to be there. Two years in severe tribulation to bring them to repentance. Now when the heavenly signs occur, God will begin to lift the pressure a little because they've already repented. And they'll begin to really look forward to Christ's second coming. So that third year, the, the percentage of, uh, of uh, destruction, or you might say the percentage of those being systematically destroyed by the Europeans, will lessen. So God begins to raise them up in the third year. Now back in uh, Deuteronomy, Moses was inspired years and years ago to mention when the Israelites would repent. Deuteronomy 4. And it says, The Eternal shall scatter you among the nations. That's yet future. And you shall be left few in number. Only a third will go into captivity of the total population of Joseph. And then of that one third, only about 10% of them will make it. In other words, about one out of 30 will finally live into the world tomorrow. But God will have a core around which he can begin to build a new world. He says, I will leave you few in number. He means it. Among the heathen, where the eternal shall lead you. Then coming on down to verse 29, But if from thence you shall seek the eternal your God, you shall find him, if you seek him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. It's going to take not only a warning message and, and a, a message of hope for the world tomorrow, but severe punishment to strip Americans of all their wealth and their power and those things that they worship along with Canadians and Britons, send them into captivity, then they're going to get down to business. Then they won't offer up, you won't, there won't be anyone, you know, praying for them, reading his prayer, you know, as you see it done on the Sunday morning hit parade. They're really praying. Now, Lord, we uh, do stand before you to worship you today. And they'll really come in the heart. So, uh, in that time, when they're in tribulation, they're really going to worship him and seek him with their whole heart because it's going to mean their life, their survival. And when you seek me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, when you're in tribulation, so he makes it specific. He says, now when you're in tribulation, just like in Hosea 5, it says, in your affliction, you will seek me. Not before. When you are in tribulation and all these things are come upon you, they know what things are coming when they come upon them in tribulation, and they're going to know. Even in the latter days, what was he talking about? The latter days. As I mentioned in a, a service in Baton Rouge, talking about the latter days or the last days. I said, you people know what last is. When you get down to your last dollar, you know it. That's when that black fellow said, amen, brother, amen. So you know what your last dollar is or your last day. So it's not hard to realize when he speaks of the latter days, the last days, he's talking about the last days of man's 6,000-year period. And that's when the tribulation is. So he says here, in tribulation, in the latter days, if you turn to the Lord your God and shall be obedient to his voice, for the eternal your God is a merciful God, and he will not forsake you, neither destroy you, nor forget the covenant. So those that finally repent, are going to know that God's not going to just, you know, fail to send Christ back and, and let all of them perish in tribulation. And that number that finally survives through the tribulation are going to know that Christ will return, deliver them out of captivity, restore them to the land of Palestine, and rebuild them. They'll finally know that of a surety. I have no doubt. Now, as I've already mentioned, how are they going to know? Well, it's very plain in many scriptures, but here in Ezekiel 33 is quite a message to the church where God says in 33, verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word of, at my mouth and warn them from me. That's why Mr. Armstrong and Ted realize that eventually you're going to have to get pretty strong and warn them and say, here's what's going to happen. But God has to, you know, uh, give them favor with leaders and finally give them such favor and, and such prominence that and national leaders will listen. Then they'll tell them. The storm song will basically reach the leadership, and Ted will reach the masses. And together as a team, they'll reach the nation. Not only the United States, but Canada and Britain in a very powerful manner. Now, coming on over to verse 29, he says, Then shall you know that I am the Eternal, when God brings these things upon them, when I have laid the land most desolate. Now, they won't know until God sends them into captivity and he's made the land desolate. 
They won't really believe it until it's too late to avert the tribulation. And God wants to make sure that he really brings the Josephites to deep, profound repentance. So he's not going to let them have a chance, you know, just they see the tribulation and they feign a kind of a weak need uh, uh, repentance. And they escape and then they return to their former ways, right, uh, immediately. He wants to make sure they have been brought so low and are wanting God's way so much that when he leads them in the land of Palestine, there be no doubt about their following him, being loyal to him, being enthusiastic and zealous for his way, and beginning to set an example for the rest of Israel and also for the rest of the world, Gentile nation after Gentile nation. So in order to get their attention so he can tell them, verses 30 through 32 here shows that they're going to be listening. Oh, there are a lot of people that praise Mr. Armstrong and Ted. Oh, they really do. They say, oh, they are really fine speakers. They have tremendous knowledge. We like to listen to them. But he says they won't do it. Down in verse 32, it says, And lo, you art unto them a very lovely song of one that has a pleasant voice. And you'd have to, uh, you know, agree that Ted has a pretty pleasant voice. He's, uh, uh, you know, recognized as one of the top speakers in the whole United States. And certain networks would just love to have him. And they'd pay him a salary, you know, like two or $300,000 a year to be a network tell, uh, newscaster. Saying, well, Barbara Walters, a million dollars, and she's worth a million, Ted's worth 16 million. Of course, they don't evaluate that way. In fact, I, uh, I think a lot of people just pay a little to see Barbara Walters taken off. I'd like to see someone speak a little faster and, and they put a little bit more life into it. But I didn't hire. And she's right next to the reasoner. And they do reason. I don't like their reasoning all that much. Although I watch them every now and then. I don't get caught at it. <laughs> For they hear your word, but they do them not. Now, that's why God's going to have to send them into captivity, because they hear, and they're going to hear very forcefully and very specifically, but God knows they're not going to really repent and do what they're told to do until he sends them into captivity. Verse 33, And when this comes to pass, and lo, it will come, then shall you know that a prophet has been among you. That's when they're going to know, not while he's still here, not while we're still here, but after we're gone. And then the tribulation is on their uh, backs. Then they will begin to know, and not before. As long as they have their churches, as long as they have their financial institutions, as long as the economy is, you know, at least together to some degree, as long as they have a, a little bit of petrol to put in their cars, they're not going to fully repent. God's going to have to snatch away that which we trust in, our riches. God says we worship the works of our hands. All you got to do is look at people in their automobiles. You realize all they do worship the works of their hands. Look at their homes. People worship things. It's not wrong to have those, but it's wrong to put them before God. That's why God's going to take them away, because they're putting them before God. They're not willing to listen and believe because they're too attached with what they have. Not only the material wealth, but their traditions, their beliefs, their clubs, their society, their uh, status among people. They put that before God. That's why God's going to crush the whole mess for the good of the people. So they're finally going to know, but not until the warning has gone out. God has taken his people away from those that have already been warned. And then he lets the United States of Europe rise up and attack and destroy. Then they're going to be believers. And when they're in Germany or other parts of Europe, you know, today they can say, well, Mr. Armstrong says these Germans are going to rise up and other nations in Europe are going to unite with them and they're going to attack and destroy Britain and Canada and the United States. Ha, ha, ha. Now the same person a few months or a few years later over with a jackbooted Nazi kicking his teeth down his throat can't say that, can he? He's going to know, you know, he knew what he's talking about. That's when they're going to know when there's no way to wiggle around it or out of it. That's why God is going to deal with them that way. That's the only way he's going to get them to really believe as a nation. I guess I've had opportunity of thinking about and teaching a great deal about the steps God will use in bringing about the world tomorrow. Mainly because of the force of my assignments. Now, when I was over in England in 1957 and 58, 
What was easy for the people in Great Britain to see, basically, the overall prophetic picture. Because there was quite a bit written about the United States of Europe attacking Great Britain and the United States. So I wasn't really, you know, forced to think about and try to convey to them some sort of a prophetic picture. Because it was already written about. But now when I went down to Australia, when I went down to Australia, it's a little different story. People down there, you know, would say, well, now they've written about Great Britain, the United States, about how they come into the prophetic picture. But what about us Australians? We would like to know a little bit about our future. So I, as a minister there, was pretty well committed to try to outline to them a meaningful prophetic picture that showed them in a logical way, a manner, by which the Australian peoples would finally learn the lesson and come to know God and be a part of the world to come. So I taught them years ago. I said, you Australians are sort of unique down here in this part of the world. You will not go down directly by the United States of Europe. And it's quite obvious, as you view the world scene, to see why that's the case. You will go down at the hands of the communist world, as fine as the communist world and the European world rise up, become the two dominant powers, the United States and Canada and Britain are destroyed, the communist world will take Australia. The European world will knock out the Western world and take over Africa, and then there will be those two big powers. I said, you will go down at the time the United States of Europe attacks the United States, Britain, Canada, and then holds the communist world sort at bay, but lets them take over the eastern side of the world. You know, uh, I don't know if they will directly have this non-aggression pact, which, you know, Napoleon and, and the Russians had. But I would assume that there will be either some open agreement or some tacit agreement between the European world and the communist world. In other words, they will sort of agree to this. We will let you communists have the Philippines, Southeast Asia, Australia, if you will not stab us the back when we knock out the enemy of both of us, the United States and Canada and Britain, which are the powers that could prevent the, the Australia or the Philippines from going, or South Africa from going under. And then, of course, they will be vying for one or the other, conquering the other power and assuming, you know, the dominant role on the world scene. There were others that, you know, made statements that Australia might fall two, three, or four years in advance of the United States going down. I've never, ever even begun to believe that. I didn't teach the Australians that. And it surely, uh, there's been no evidence developing in the world scene to indicate that would be the case. It's only logical. I told the Australians, I said, you had better realize that the United States of America with its military might, is the only reason you people are a free country down here now and have not been taken over by the Japanese and the Chinese, who would just love to have your country. And the only reason the communists haven't done it is because they know the power they would have to contend with, the United States, should they try. And I said, they will not take over your country until the United States is no longer a power with which to reckon. And they will be no longer a power with which to reckon when the United States of Europe knocks them out. So when that part of Joseph is punished, so will you be punished. That is, as a nation down here. But you will not be punished directly by the United States of Europe, but indirectly by the communist world. In other words, the uh, Germans are not going to go down to Australia. That's not a very profitable thing. So I had to preach quite a bit on how the Australians fit into the overall prophetic scene. 
in the Philippines. As I was teaching the Filipino people, they were concerned about their country. They said, yeah, it's all right for, you know, uh, for them to write about and teach about the future, uh, that is, the, uh, the way by which the United States and Britain go down, but we'd like to know over here in the Philippines, what about us? Well, if you were a minister in my position at that particular time, what would you do? You'd try to figure out how to show them how they fit in the prophetic scene. You couldn't just all shut up and read about what's going to happen in the United States. You couldn't just tell the Australians, all oh, shut up, I'm not going to t- tell you anything about your future down here. You know, you're not a concern. All we're concerned about is how the United States, Canada, and Britain fit into the scene. So by the very force of the assignment, the Filipinos urging said, please, would you show us how we fit into the picture? So that further promoted the overall picture. South Africa, same story. I'll tell you a little bit about the South African situation. And it's really the catalyst, that along with the Middle East oil, is really the catalyst that will bring about the coming United States of Europe and the downfall of the United States. And I taught the people in South Africa this back in 1963 and 64, 65, up to 14 years ago. You have to understand a little bit about the unique position of South Africa to understand why the communist world wants it and why the Germans would never, ever begin to let the communists take over South Africa. That is one of the most strategic areas on the face of the earth outside of the Middle East. Because if you control shipping around Cape Hope, and you also have a strong white government that will help you force the rest of Africa to produce for you, you've got a powerhouse. You've got a potential powerhouse there with natural resources much of the rest of the world doesn't have. Europe wants the resources of of Africa. And know, they know the only way by which they could be absolutely assured of that coming to Europe, and remember the reason Hitler lost the war was because he ran out of raw materials, not because he ran out of men, not because they weren't good fighters, but they ran out of raw materials. They ran out of gas, they ran out of food, they ran out of a lot of other things, mineral items and so forth. So the next time they're going to have to ensure they have the oil and they have the natural resources to not only gain the victory, but to keep it. I don't think most people realize what's going on, why the communists are so concerned. They're not concerned about Zaire so much or Angola or Mozambique. They're concerned about South Africa. That's what they want, because if you control South Africa, you've got the rest of Africa. You control the shipping around the south part of Africa there, and you've got the rest of the world, you know, pretty well under your control to beckon at your command. So I, uh, as I was down there, began to develop the prophetic picture of the South Africans. First of all, I had to understand a little bit about the, you know, the strategic area and how the South African peoples became what they are. Most people don't realize. First of all, you probably may have heard this, but most people would not be aware of it. When Germany and Britain went to war, the average American would assume the South Africans immediately jumped in to back Britain. And the average American would be wrong. They voted on it. I mean, the first of all, to vote on whom you back, whether you back Germany or Britain, says a great deal. They barely won the vote to back Britain. Because at that particular time, the United Party, which is the English people, were in power. The United Party was in power. The ones who voted against it were the National Party, the Afrikaners, who are very compatible with, have many affinities to the German peoples. They wanted to back the Germans. And it's only because they were not in authority, they were not the ruling party, that they didn't win. Now, At the end of World War II and just following, Nazis were knee-deep down there. They harbored a lot of Nazis. Right after World War II, the National Party came into power. And the ones who came into power were the ones that would have backed Germany had they had the vote to do so at the outset of World War II. And they have remained in power. They're the Afrikaans people. 
They've gained the power because they've had a secret organization and they're called the Bruder Bond. But if you become a member of the Bruder Bond, only a very select few Afrikaners. You have to be an Afrikaner and you have to be a select individual. And it's such a secret organization and it's so tightly and strongly controlled that if you are a husband that becomes a member of the Bruder Bond, even your wife is never to know it at the risk of your own life. And so it was a hard organization to ever break into and understand what their objectives were. Their objectives were to plant individuals that were members of this very inner core of Afrikaners called the Bruderbahn, the Brotherhood of, of, uh, of the Afrikaners. And their strategy was to work one of their men into positions of power in some phase of the South African society or government, industry or commerce or education, and then work that man up, and then he, in turn, would work other Bruderbonders in. And finally, they would begin to gain the control of that particular facet of the economy or the government. So over a period of a few years, that's why by the time 1946 came around the elections, the National Party won, because they had already gained so much power. So they have taken over just about all of South Africa except finances. They've taken over the social structure, the educational structure. That's why they force people to, everyone has to take Afrikaans. And when you're down there talking on the phone, they're going to try to force you to speak Afrikaans. And some will condescend when they, you just keep, you know, speaking English. They'll, some will and some will not speak English with you. In other words, the, the Afrikaners have always resented and hated the British, the English element there, coming from Britain primarily. And they have, uh, because they always felt inferior, and they always felt they were looked down on, so their secret organization was raised up so the Afrikaners could gain the power and, and root out, eradicate from the country the English element. So now they are pretty well in charge. So their peoples, like Foster or, or uh, Ververt, you know, who was the prime minister assassinated down there a few years ago, they were hardcore uh, Afrikaners plus being Bruderbonders. They finally broke in the organization when I was there and let a lot of this out, but not until they were already pretty well in power, and some of the journalists that did so fled the country. Michael Bowesville used to work for me. His father was a journalist in Johannesburg, and he fled to England because he feared his life once some of this stuff was opened up to the public. Do you know that Mr. Foster, who is the prime minister right now, he and his brother spoke, gave speeches during at the outset of World War II as to why they ought to back Germany. In other words, they had no loyalty but rather hatred toward the British people and loyalty toward the Germans. See, most people don't realize what this is setting up South Africa for and why the Germans are there in abundance today. We had uh, one member in particular that was a part of a, of a governmental uh, organization that had to do with selecting uh, uh, what country you purchase goods from, supplies, equipment, and so forth. And that particular organization pretty well oriented itself to buying German goods. And they have a rotational program with the German peoples where they bring Germans down there and rotate them through their system for six months and they get new ones down there. So they become very familiar with the country and they exercise tremendous influence. They've got a lot of under the table agreements. Now you see, First of all, the National Party realizes its position in the world. It realizes someone's going to have to rise up and give it some military backing lest it goes under. Now, they have been working since World War II to have this relationship with the Germans, feeling they're the only people that think like they think that would back up a strong, racist government and would allow them to continue their apartheid policy. And the Germans also see in South Africa a people that think like they think, that would be willing under their strong military backing to enforce the German way on the rest of Africa and sort of hold the rest of Africa in a vice. So Germany on the one side or Europe on one side and a strong South Africa on the other side are going to force the Africans to produce for Europe. So they've had a lot of... Uh, of contact that the world doesn't know anything about. Under the table agreements. Now, on the one hand, the South African peoples know they can't rely on the United States, 
of Britain. But they know if Germany were to try to overtly come in and take over too soon, they would have to deal with the Americans. So the Afrikaners are going to have to know that when this above-the-table relationship is made, that they don't have to worry about retaliatory measures from the United States and Britain. So that's going to make the Germans know, in order for them to back up South Africa and get their will done, they're going to have to eliminate the ones that are interfering, the Americans. So there's a lot both sides know must occur in order to, for them to survive. So I was telling the South African people 14 years ago, I said, here's the way it's going to happen. Here's the way Joseph here is going to be betrayed. You Josephites here, you English people down here are going to be betrayed by your own brothers, just like America and Canada and Britain will be betrayed by their brothers in Western Europe. They will betray them by joining the United States of Europe and selling their brother Joseph into slavery. Now, when the brothers down here, the Afrikaners, join with Germany and Europe, they will finally do what they want to do for many years, get rid of you English-speaking people from South Africa. And they're just waiting for that time to come. I said, so what will finally happen is the United States of Europe will come on the scene because they will not let the communist world have Africa. And when the communist world tries to take over this very strategic area, Europe is going to have to unite, flex its muscles, back up South Africa, and force the rest of Africa to be loyal to and in support of Europe rather than letting the communists take over. And I said the stage is already set. The Afrikaans people would love that relationship, and the Germans would love it, and that's why there's such a affinity here and so much under-the-table movement and activity going on. There are two things. I brought these things out in my campaign. Two things that will trigger the end of the United States and Britain and Canada and the tribulation. That is, bring the United States of Europe on the scene. Middle East oil and the South African situation. They're not going to stand by and let the communists take over the oil of this world and cut off the oil supply to Europe because that would be devastating to the European economy. And they're not going to stand by and let the communists take over South Africa and lose this vast African continent that Europe so direly needs. Now we see the communists making moves, not only toward the Middle East, but toward South Africa. So you can pretty well sort of count down. They have said probably in two or three years at the outside, they're going to try to force a majority rule in South Africa. Now, before that ever comes about as a ploy of the communists to take over South Africa and then have Africa, the Germans will flex their muscles. Just let the Arab peoples once again try to impose an oil embargo on Europe. And you will see those Europeans unite with Germany at the head of that combine to go down and secure the Middle East oil and also tell the world we're going to back up the South African government and don't you interfere. At the same time, they're going to say, okay, we're going to knock you out, United States and Britain. I may not just tell them that, they'll just do it. So the countdown is already there to trigger the United States of Europe. It's not going to be just sort of a gradual development. It's going to be something that's forced upon them. By the communist world seeing they want the oil, they want Africa, the Europeans say, we want it. Now, as the communists are forcing their way in to take over Europe, when they can no longer depend on America, well, they don't want to, but they've had to, when they see that we're withdrawing and opening the door of the communist intrusion, then they're going to have to unite. And don't think they haven't been making plans since before World War II was over. Articles have been written in The Plain Truth and published years ago about the Nazis going underground before the end of World War II and planning for World War III. About the Nazis going underground before the end of World War II and planning for World War III. That's why they began to have contact with South Africans back then. And that's uh, one reason, as, as the plans toward that direction were being developed, that the National Party was able to come on the scene in 1946, just on schedule. So finally, when Europe needed that kind of a government in South Africa to be there and ready to look to Germany and say, no one else will help us, and we want you. And when they become this vast military power in Europe, they're going to give South African government military backing. 
And they're going to knock out the West, knock out the United States, Britain, and Canada, so they're, they're no longer a threat, and they're going to tell the rest of the world, the communist world, if you get out of line, we'll destroy you just like we destroyed the United States and Britain. And that's why no one can make war at the base fire. They're going to hold the whole world at bay for a couple of years. So before, South Africa and the Middle East trigger that final formation of Europe and the tribulation, God has got to get Mr. Armstrong and Ted before the leadership of the United States and Canada and Britain so they can be warned in advance of the attack by the United States of Europe. So when you see that the triggering mechanisms are already there and already in use like the Middle East and South Africa, you know the time is short. So once this message goes out with power to Joseph, see, God's going to bring the Josephites to repentance first because they're going to be the leaders in the world tomorrow. So he's going to bring... Uh, nations to repentance according to the order by which he's going to build them in the world to come. And since the Josephites, Ephraim and Manasseh are going to be the leaders, God has to bring them to repentance first and more profoundly because they're... we've already done what the tribulation is designed to do, bring about repentance. What God wants us to do is get the message out in the warning and tell them you've got to repent just like we have. They won't do it for the tribulation. But rather than let us go into the tribulation, God says, I'll protect you because you've already done what the tribulation is going to bring about among your people, Joseph. I mean, it's my people, but from whom you, among whom you've been. And in Revelation 12, it's very specific, in verse 14, that the church will flee or take, be taken or whatever to a place prepared. And I think that is where we get some final training. Because you're going to have a lot of churches, schools, programs out of Europe into the land of Palestine without a group of educators with programs not already developed for them. God can't bring them and say, wait around six months, we hope we can get some programs developed for you. Well, they'd revert to their former practices very quickly unless you've got the right thing to give them in place of that from which they turned. So God can't afford to give them any time to, you know, in idleness because they begin to revert to what they know and what they know is what God's breaking them of. So God protects his people, and then there are two witnesses. Now, I'm not saying that Mr. Herbert Armstrong, Gunner, Ted are, but I'll just say if you were God and you were looking down to try to find the two most qualified men that you could use to witness to the world, would you use those most qualified or go out here and get a couple of farmers that don't know anything about it, and, and they go down to Jerusalem and try to speak to the world? Why not use the same group and the leadership of that same group to finish the job and carry the program over the world tomorrow? I'm not saying they are, but I just believe they are myself. And so when we finish the work in Joseph, we get out because the world scene is going to be too uh, dangerous for us to be anywhere. And then there will just be two voices, the same voices, but protected in the international city of Jerusalem, which it will become. And they will reside in Jerusalem, not every day, but that's where they will uh, speak. That's where they will... Uh, have the protection and the guarantees of the international body of nations. It'll be an international city open to anyone, any political group or any religious group. It'll be the only place on the face of the earth that's internationalized and therefore open to any group. That's why the Pope can be there speaking as well as God's servants because of the international uh, realization of that city which the Pope is pushing for and people realize it's got to be internationalized and the only way to solve the uh, Jerusalem problem. So, why would God want them down there about six months before the United States and Britain go under? To warn the Europeans, especially those in Western Europe, that first of all they're Israelites and say, you French people are Israelites, you're Reubenites. You Swiss people are Gadites. You Dutch people are uh, Zebulonites and so forth. Don't you join this coming formation in Europe and betray your own blood kin the British and the American peoples, like your forefathers, betrayed Joseph into slavery, which was a type. So they'll say, don't join this United States of Europe because you're actually compatible to the British and the American peoples. You are not Gentiles. You cannot join them and have a future. Don't do it. They'll go ahead and do it. They're going to be warned first so God can punish them for doing it. You ever read the book of Joel about a drought, a famine? It's not talking about the United States and Britain because it's, it's the theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord, not the tribulation. Hosea is, a, is advance warning before the tribulation. Joel is a warning before the day of the Lord. 
Hosea is a, is a message of warning to the Josephites. Ephraim and Manasseh, whereas Joel is a warning to the rest of the Israelites, you'd better come out of this combine that you've joined before God intervenes begins to plague Europe, or you will suffer the same plagues God will pour out on Europe. So for about six months, they'll warn these Israelites of Western Europe, don't do it. And also the other Gent the Gentiles, don't do it because God will punish you if you do. Don't attack and take captive the British and American people, they're, they're God's people, Joseph. If you do, God will punish you. The Josephites are your only hope of the future. They'll go ahead and do it. You know why the United States of Europe won't last very long? God says it's a mixture of iron and clay. And God has always used clay as being typical of the uh, Israelites and iron, the Gentiles. So when they join, God will dry the clay up and then hit the system real hard. The clay will you know, break, and the iron will fall apart. So God will begin to dry up the clay by withholding the rain. And you know the two witnesses are going to have power to withhold the rain, send plagues? Now, if I were one of them, which I'm not, but if I were there, I'd just say, okay, you you people in France are going to realize you're Reubenites because from this day forward you won't get any more rain. It'll rain on the Germans. It'll rain right up to your border, but it won't rain on this country. Even after about six months, I think I could begin to make at least a few people think. And tell those Swiss people, it'll snow on the Italian Alps, it won't snow on the Swiss Alps. And the snow stops, and the skier comes along and runs off snow and hits rock. You say, I must be in uh, God, Gad's country. Not God's, but Gad's. <laughs> so the plagues that are outlined in Joel are a means by which the Israelites of Western Europe can be plagued, so God dries up that element and begins to, to break up that United States of Europe. So when the Gentiles are actually producing the food and, and really the mainstays of the economy and they realize the French and the Swiss and the Belgian and the, and the Dutch are not doing their part, that's going to begin to cause somewhat of a rift. But you know, those Israelites will still be afraid to pull out unless God really shakes them up, so they're going to continue to be warned. First, don't betray your brother Joseph. When they do, they're going to say, you shouldn't have done it. He's your only hope. If he perishes in tribulation, you have no hope. You'd better come out of this combine and ask God to forgive you or you don't have a future. And of course, God's got to bring the French and others where they'll be willing to accept the English and Americans as their leaders. And that's going to be quite a job to accomplish. So after two years of tribulation, six months of warning, that's why the two witnesses are in Jerusalem three and a half years. They're there to warn before the United States of Europe attacks, is formulated and attacks and destroys the United States and Britain who go into captivity and are in tribulation two years then they're in the day of the Lord for one year, and then Christ returns. So for six months before the United States of Europe rises up and attacks, the two witnesses are there to warn them before they do it. Then after they do it, say, you shouldn't have done it. These uh, Josephites are your only hope. You'd better pull out of this combine. They won't do it, and they'll finally say, now if you don't pull out when God intervenes in the heavens, through the heavenly signs, then you will suffer the plagues God will pour out on Europe. So when God intervenes and turns off the heat of the sun just briefly and causes the moon to become like blood, and of course that will upset any space program that the Europeans have to keep the rest of the world at bay when you have a highly computerized, solar energized, uh, and solar propelled uh, space program that they will use to knock out the United States, Britain, and Canada, and they keep the rest of the world at bay, then when that goes out of whack, then the communists who would just be or just uh, urgent to attack Europe, but afraid, knowing they could be knocked out immediately. Then when God knocks out their space program with the heavenly signs, then these uh, Israelites of Europe are going to find a fear of God enough to pull out. And that's going to tend to weaken, and it will weaken Europe. And so the communists are going to say, this is the time to attack. That's when tidings come from the north and east. But you see, they miscalculate, because there's certain residual things that are not directly connected to the space program the Germans still have, like a paralyzing substance to paralyze whole armies. So when the communist world begins to attack, the European world hits them first. That's the first war in Revelation 9. And they, they immobilize their advanced troops for five months. That's when men seek death for five months and can't find it. Now, if you, uh, if you seek death for five months and can't find it, the only way by which you could do that and not be an absolute idiot is to be paralyzed. For your mind to still be working but your whole motor system to be paralyzed. So they will have a paralyzing substance so when these communist armies begin to move toward Europe, 
they just paralyzed the whole army, began to build a network around them, let them know when you come out of this paralysis, paralyzed state, you will be slaves of the Germans. They would rather die than experience that. But when you're completely paralyzed, you can't do anything about it. That's when men seek death for five months and can't find it. If I sought death for five months and couldn't find it, it'd be pretty bad. I'd go out here on the road and find it in five minutes. Easy. Head on collision. Go buy a gun. Or ain't most anything. So when you seek death for five months and can't find it, it's because it's not possible. You're paralyzed. Your mind works, but the motor system is paralyzed. And, of course, the Germans would have that as a strategy so they could immobilize whole armies and build a network around them when they come out of paralysis. They're slaves. Then they work for the fatherland. So then, finally, after that five months, the communist world also are going to have their secrets. As the book of Joel brings out, when they finally push across into Europe after the five months, thank God wants to hold them back five months so the Josephites can flee from concentration camps, leg labor camps in Central Europe to Western Europe where their brothers have repented and finally say, we don't have much over here, but at least you can survive over here. And they'll flee to the west part of Europe, which is the Israelitish part, and then God will let the communist world push down and devastate the beast power. And he's mentioned when they come, the, the people are absolutely crazy. You can read in Joel 2 that when these Europeans see these communist soldiers coming, and just one part of the army is 200 million, so they have quite an army. I have every man, woman, and child conscripted in that great massive communist uh, army of the whole uh, eastern world over there, China, Russia, Japan, India, and that whole area will all be one big combine when he's knocked down the European power, so they ascend to the prominent position and control the world. But when they finally push over, it says that their pain, when they look at their face, they realize these people are crazy. Their pain, when they look at their face, they say they, they, they leap over walls, they go through windows, and, they, and a man is thrust with the sword and does not fall. Well, that's high-powered uh, uh, action on the adrenaline gland. You know, you can shoot a deer. If he's already stirred up his adrenaline, he might run a mile or two before he drops. So they will be willing to expend maybe two or three, well, a hundred or so million soldiers to gain the victory for the communist world. <clears throat> so they'll probably have them doped up as well as demonized. And when they march into Europe, they're going to devastate the whole of Europe, but not Western Europe. God promises the Israelites and Joel, if you repent, I will protect you from the northern army. Now, why would God want to protect them? Because they've repented. And also because they've been willing to accept Joseph as their future leader. And they have been a, a place of refuge before the communist armies come down and devastate Central Europe. So the communists moved down, which is the second world, and the last six months before Christ returns, they devastate Europe, and they push down, destroying by the multiple millions. And finally, all those armies merge and march on Jerusalem at the day Christ returns, and he intervenes and destroys those armies. But when he does, he has his people Israel repentant in Western Europe. A few are scattered in other parts of the world, but the basic uh, grouping of them are in Western Europe, where <clears throat> the French, the Swiss, and other Israelites have come to realize God will lead them and bless them through Joseph. Just like the brothers had become to acknowledge God would not bless them except through Joseph down in Egypt. And he brought their attitudes from an attitude of hatred to an attitude of love and concern and acceptance, which is a type of the future. The French would never accept the British and the Americans over them except God through a force set of circumstances bring it about. So when they finally realize they have betrayed their brother Joseph, they've seen them systematically being destroyed in Europe, and they finally are, are you know, convinced by God they'd better do something about it, and they repent at the time of the heavenly signs, then from that time forward they will finally be of an attitude of mind of saying, Joseph, now we recognize that God has groomed you to be our leaders in the world to come. And uh, we are willing to follow you and knowing that God will bless us through you in the world to come that he will use the Ephraimites to colonize the world through and the Manassites to be the greatest single nation to show other nations how they use God's wealth and power and so forth to their own national greatness. And then Christ will deliver those Israelites out of in the north country, restore them the land of Palestine with the Josephites, the most beaten down and the most repentant of all the Israelites. And the rest of the Israelites are willing to follow God's leadership through them. And then when they're all in Palestine, we have to be there with schools, churches, colleges, programs, social activities, cultural activities, family activities, and so forth. So when God leads them into Palestine, he says, this is the way walk ye in it. 
So we are changed to the spirit of Christ's second coming, and as part of the government of God, the educational program, we're there to teach them and say, here's the way, walk you in it. Here are the schools for your children, and our children are the leaders in them. Here are the churches where you worship the God you've turned to want to worship. And we'll be there to teach, to preach, to counsel, to lead, and to help them. We'll have the schools for their children. We'll have the technical schools, the grades, or the uh, commercial schools, the agricultural schools, the whole program, not only teach them the way to live, but teach them how to sharpen their basic talents to become constructive in building up the world in the future, the world tomorrow. And then, of course, three and a half years will be spent in Palestine re-educating the Israelites so they become alike to the Gentiles. Then God will allow, by that time, the Germans and the Egyptians will finally want to follow the Israelites before they want to destroy them. So you let the Germans come from the north, the Egyptians from the south, to join Israel. And then as they turn, other Gentiles that have looked to their leadership will turn and say, if they've done that, well, there must be something to it, and we'd like to follow suit. So God begins to absorb Gentiles into the commonwealth of Israel as well as transplanting Americans back to America, Britons back to Britain, Europeans back to Western Europe, Australians back to Australia, South Africans back to South Africa. So they become a light to the Gentiles that have lived around them. And when they see them come back with a changed approach, a changed way of life, they're going to find that, boy, there are different peoples. And if someone did that much for them, maybe we'd better follow whoever it is. Then you say, well, we're God's people. We follow the God of Israel. We follow Jesus Christ in Jerusalem and his government. That's why we're being blessed. That's why we're prosperous. That's why we know how to live. And then nation after nation will begin to join the commonwealth of Israel. Australia will influence Indonesians and, and Burmese people and Malaysians and finally Indians. And Manasseh will finally influence across the Philippines and use that little black... American colony, as they have often referred to themselves, the little brown Americans, to influence Japanese and Chinese, look back through them to Manasseh and realize what can be done for them if they follow the God of Israel through Manasseh's leadership, because it's done that much for the Filipino people. And nation by nation, God will absorb them, and finally, after about 10 to 15 years, all nations will be in the commonwealth of Israel, and all peoples will be educated and know the true God and live the way of life, and God will finally have established his world, and the millennium will start then God can bring generation after generation after generation into that family. And by the end of the millennium, prepare the earth to resurrect the rest of the dead. And we'll still be there. Work will just keep going. Keep teaching people and showing them the way and absorbing into the family of God and keeping the whole family structure under control and absorbing generation after generation into a going family society, a going family corporation. Then God, after the millennium will resurrect the rest of the dead, and they will come up to see what God has done in a thousand years as opposed to what they in six thousand years failed to do. And then they will be given their chance. it will be a time of real witnessing, getting the message out and getting everything prepared to reach them, have to know their language, their grunts, whatever they communicated through when they went under. And then it began to invite them in by living in that way of life, by producing in that economic structure. And, and remaining loyal and proving they want to be a part of it forever, then inviting them in, bring them in at the end of the 100-year period. Then the family will be complete, and the father will come down, take over the family, and he will work through the same organizational structure that has been built into the very family of God, the structure that was used to absorb the family, to build the family. Then he will continue to work through that system, and, uh, and we will be right at headquarters, as Revelation 3 brings out. We'll bear the Father's name. We'll bear the new name of Christ. We'll bear the name of the headquarters city. I'm very confident when the Father's there, he will set the example. He will introduce new programs, enlarge on programs, and he and Christ will be united. And, and Christ will show the rest of those at headquarters that he is absolutely in agreement with the Father, and they are like one. Then we, as an educational group, can take that program that they are promoting and put it into group action under their wise supervision. Then when it meets their approval, they say, okay, now since you know how to educate the rest of the family, because that's what you've been doing for 1,100 years, I want you then to teach them what I'm teaching you. So the Father and Christ teach us, and we teach others who in turn teach others, and it filters down to the very junior level of the family of God. And through that system, God will keep the family moving forward, not only controlling its society, but controlling its its kingdom, its uh, corporate structure, all the many nations making up that kingdom, and through the social system, control the way by which the family of God grows in more abundant living right down into eternity. And then through the kingdom structure, the corporate structure, controlling what the family produces by way of goods and services to ensure progress in the family of God. And all that additional 
wherewithal will be properly utilized because the family of God knows how to live and absorb into their very way of life these extra benefits. And so that system will just carry right on down into eternity, as I said at the outset, that this work not only carries over into the world tomorrow, but carries on down through the millennium, the great white throne judgment period, out into the new earth forever. I think when we see it in that light, we can begin to understand a little bit more why God has his mind so intently on it. See you next Sabbath.